welcome to epg patshala dear students today we would be discussing the evolution of settlements after christ era part 3 that would include the gupta empire which extended from 320 to 550 ac or after christ era then roman empire which extended from 27 to 476 ac and the medieval europe from 5th century to 15th century ac now when we discuss the gupta empire we find that the gupta empire spread you can see the spread of gupta empire in this drawing and uh, it was basic mainly in india erstwhile india and it was located along the ganges and in the indus river valley the prominent kings were samudra gupta followed by the very famous chandra gupta the second which was vikramaditya the administration system was similar to the mauryans as we discussed mauryans we had discussed in the earlier module so but larger focus was on public participation that was this was very significant point and then they in this point of time and in this era there was this emergence of the iconic carved stone deity in hindu art and the rock cut monasteries in ajanta came at this point of time when we try to understand the socio economic characteristics in this era or in this time period we find that the buddhism and jainism was propagated and hinduism gained momentum in terms of the religious characteristics or but when we try to see the economic activities we find that the international trade declined because international trade was mainly with rome and uh, all the uh, that part of the world where, as rome declined international trade also declined and thus it caused loss of income to the residents and the towns lost money and uh, there was less of taxes and all that now there was also achievements in uh, discipline such as science technology engineering art literature mathematics religion and philosophy there was prevalence of mining and metallurgy textile production was there there was dyeing there was embroidery and another very significant um, aspect or the study or the discipline which came out was astronomy there were detailed study and manuscripts which started on astronomy we have the Man manasara shilpa shastra and we have manasara vastu shastra manasara actually means the essence of measurement and shilpa shastra and vastu shastra is the is the essence of measurement and application of this measurement in art and art architecture as you know uh, shilpa is about art and vastu is about talking about architecture now this manasara shilpa shastra and vastu shastra which came in the 6th century after christ era that is ace based on this there were the measurements which was given this table shows the various measurement units there was these units like paramanus and eight paramanus formed one rathadhuli that is the cardus so there were lot of and as you can see the last one that there are eight dandas which formed a rajju that is string so based on based on um, uh, finger based on uh, rod based on string so these measurement units were formed now coming to the site planning that means coming to the how uh, or basically the architectural or the town planning um, aspects which uh, were uh, involved and which came up with this manasara we find that there were these uh, various uh, uh, considerations for site selection of any building so we find that orientation then uh, layout with the center that is the brahmasthan so this sort of considerations then the placement of the buildings then the proportions pertaining to the buildings 
then the building materials, sustainable systems, all these are included and are put forth in the Mansara Vastu Shastra because site related to architecture, so Vastu Shastra. Now, when we go to the uh, way back in that time, we see that land use is was one that means the land was categorized into arable lands that is cultivable lands which we call as cultivable lands today arable lands then forests then reservoirs then mines and other lands and in arable lands there were crown lands there were private lands there were pastures in the forest land it was a productive land and and as the say at the same time a non productive land and productive is for produce and then there were elephant forests then non productive land they were reserved for aesthetics then recreation for wildlife sanctuaries non productive is a more passive use of the of that area that is that's why for aesthetics or saints or aesthetics and for recreation uh, it was used then reservoir is was one was a crown property that is crown property is about the monarchy about the about the king's property so crown property and the rest was a private property there was another classification of private property also next was the mines before going to the mines reservoirs also referred to uh, actually water bodies so there was the water bodies which was owned by the kings or the monarch or the monarchy and the uh, there were also private uh, water bodies which which were private property now we come to the mines now the mines were also the same thing it was there was a it was owned by the uh, kings or the or the emperor or the monarchy and uh, uh, second was leased to private operators the second category so uh, that means through th and then last was the uh, the category of others which was suitable for settlements and then and then there was also a category of wasteland so from this land use classification we can see that in this land use classification land the understanding of what use the land would be put to and what would be used for uh, settlements that knowledge was there way back in 6th century AC. When we look at the settlement pattern which is put forth by Mansara, Shilpa Sastra, Vastu Sastra we find that there were various typologies of settlement patterns which were put forth and um, for which was applicable for different situations like some were some was along the river or along a water course or some was um, uh, in, in uh, different context actually the depending upon the contextual applicability the typology was given and um, the components also varied with that the street plan also varied with that so the first Settle, uh, typology of settlement was Dandaka, which we are discussing here is the Dan Dandaka, the first typology, which is uh, which was applicable for a context where it was in terms of small towns and villages which were rectangular or had a square site, and this um, this um, plan had uh, four entrance gates on four sides, and the components were the female deity was located outside the village as the presiding deity and the male deities were located in the north and the officers were in the east. So, th there were certain directional principles also of locating these deities or uh, these um, offices uh, or what significant um, uses of the land also depended on the directional directions. Then the street pattern, there were straight streets crossing at right angles, there were single row of houses along the transverse streets at the extreme and double row of houses along the principal or the central streets. As you can see in this drawing, the drawing of Dandaka is given here. So, next we come to the next category or the second category is the Sarvato Bhadra. The Sarvato Bhadra was applicable or this typology of um, settlement pattern was applicable for larger villages and towns with a square site divided into interchambers after Manduka Mandala or Sthandila Mandala. 
The components or the most significant part of this pattern was that the temple dominated the village. Then there were single row of houses on internal streets and double row along the outer streets and there were varying houses for all classes of people. You can see in the drawing, the drawing shows uh, the essence of what, what I am speaking of. The next comes the Nandiyavarta. The Nandiyavarta was, was prescribed for situations or a, for a context that is the towns, for towns with circular or square sites. So you can see in the drawing that if they, it is a circular site, then how would the pattern be? If it is a square site or a rectangular site, what would the pattern be? And the components was applicable for about 3000 to 4000 houses and the temple was again in the center. And the layout was in the form of this name of Nandiyavarta goes by the name of Nandiyavarta flower. So the layout is in the form of Nandiyavarta flower and the streets were parallel to the center adjoining streets and then um, we come to the next is the the next um, typology or the next type of settlement pattern was Padmaka. Now Padmaka as you know is from Padma is the lotus flower and the Padmaka was inspired actually or the concept came from the lotus flower. Now, uh, it resembled the petals of lotus radiating outwards from the center and but it had also grid pattern of roads and this the context of this or applicability of this pattern was for the towns with fortress or fortress all around that means wherever there was a fortress. So, though there was a grid pattern, but the petals were like a fortress walls which were surrounding this uh, town. But one problem of this is that it was like an island and there was no scope for expansion. It was more contained, more, more compact and there was this wall and everything had to be. Uh, so this was a, this was another typology. Now came the second uh, or the next typology is the swastika. Now swastika as we all know sw swastika is a symbol which we all use in our daily lives. Now swastika is, uh, so it is basically um, as you can see in the drawing, there were the diagonal streets which are dividing the site into certain triangular plots and rect rather rectangular plots, not triangular but rectangular plots and then there were two main streets crossing at the center running north, south and east, west and this site uh, can be um, of any shape, it can be divided into Paramasayika Mandala and there is this wall which surrounds the town and there is this provision of a moat at its foot. So the moat is a more rectangular thing which surrounds this uh, uh, is at the perimeter or which, which um, bounds or which dictates the perimeter of the this town, this town typology. Then we come to the prastara. Now the prastara as you can see. Uh, it is for a square or a rectangular site divided in the form of Paramasaika, Manduka or Standila. Now it may or may not be surrounded by a moat and the street pattern was of varying sizes of the site for different classes of the society and the roads again well, it was similar to the earlier one which we were mentioning and the roads were running east west and north south. Now we come to the next categories of the typology that is the Karmuka. You can see in the figure it is Karmuka. Now Karmuka actually is semicircular and it, it is a typology which can be located in, um, in on the seashore or on river banks. So it is a semicircular form which is uh, a, um, for a settlement which for on the river banks or on the seashore and the, mm, the temple is built in any convenient place. It is not that at the center or it can be built in any convenient place. The cross streets actually run at right angles dividing the whole area into blocks. The streets radiate actually from the center as you can see in the drawing. 
the streets are radiating from the center. Then we have the Chaturmukh. Chaturmukh is again for square or rectangular sites, uh, all towns and villages and the temple of the preceding deity is at the center. Now the towns is laid out east to west lengthwise with four main streets. So this is as far as the Gupta empire and the Gupta time period or the Gupta era goes. Now we come to the case studies of uh, historic or traditional settlements based on uh, where these concepts which uh, I was discussing. So Varanasi uh, or Banaras uh, was based uh, on Mansara Shilpa Shastra uh, and that is how it developed. It was built around 2nd century AD and uh, also known as Banaras, Banaras or Kashi. So it is a famous uh, Hindu holy city uh, situated on the uh, river on the banks of the river Ganges in, in the state of Uttar Pradesh and in present day Varanasi it has a high concentration uh, of pilgrims and tourists from all over the world. Uh, it is um, a, now a famous religious traditional and a commercial center. It was initially ruled by the Hindu rulers and then by Mughal rule followed by British as cantonment township. The settlement as you can see in these drawings, uh, Varanasi was uh, came up between the two rivers that is Varuna in the north as you can see in the figure and Assi in the south in figure 1 and the settlement developed along the river along the river Ganges and um, it was initially a port town built along the river. It had a radial layout of roads with multiple focal uh, foci that is uh, you can see in uh, the figure 2 and then there was caste based distribution of population in concentric circles and the inner belt of development were for higher castes in close proximity to the temples. The most famous temple of Banaras or Varanasi was the Kashi Vishwanath temple and all the people of higher castes they were located in close proximity to the temple of Kashi Vishwanath and which was and the outer belt was of the lower caste can you, as you can see in figure 3. Now the prince uh, the drawing of Benares in 1822 shows the organic growth of the city in due course of time. So it spread away from the river below within these two rivers that is Varuna and Assi. This is as far as Varanasi is concerned and how it, how it spread, how it developed in a brief way, we stated we briefly I am trying to give these case studies uh, and in Madurai, Madurai was is in south of India, it is in Tamil Nadu, it is known for the temple that is the Minakshi temple as you can see in this figure, uh, in this picture and it is also known as the Athens of the east as well as the city of junctions and Madurai was also. Uh, developed using the principles of Mantra Shilpa Sastra. It was planned in the year 1529 by Vishnath Nayak, king of the Nayak dynasty. Now if we look at the settlement planning of Madurai, we see that uh, Madurai uh, had this uh, a rectangular form which is this temple that is the center that was the focus of the uh, city and you can see in um, this figure and it was uh, designed as per as I said Mansara Shilpa Sastra, it is basically the Rajadhani plan. So there was a five fold concentric rectangular formation around the temple core and uh, these figures show that and there was a walled city with a moat and then the settlement pattern was based on caste and occupational hierarchy. The hierarchy of street pattern with street width, in fact, 
decreasing street width. There was a hierarchy of street pattern with decreasing street width as they branch out. So this was how uh, Madurai uh, was developed with Minakshi temple as its core of the as the core of the city and um, so the, uh, then we come to the third case study that is Jaipur which was also based on the principles of Manasara Shilpa Sastra planned in the year 1727 by Maharaja Savai Jai Singh and Vidyadhar Bhattacharya was the architect or the sthapati what we call as the architect uh, and the city is built in the form of an eight part mandala known as Pithapada. Can you can see in this figure there was these nine squares city was divided into nine squares and um, basically uh, because of the hill one of the squares were not not uh, uh, so it could not have the square so that square came in towards the eastern side of the city so um, the placement of one of the squares so from the hill it came to the eastern side of the city as you can see in these um, big figures and um, city was planned keeping in mind the vastu sastra uh, now regarding this city as you can it is a grid iron pattern so nine square with a grid iron pattern and um, it had uh, considered the sun path and then it has considered the wind direction so these were the or the climate conscious uh, planning was there uh, in I mean, long before we had our modern planning concepts in 1727 we had these concepts now you can see in this figure um, the street hierarchy of Jaipur it was grid pattern so planned as sectors separated by wide streets and there was a hierarchy of streets the first order street defined the sector size and the second order street defined the neighborhood or the block and you can see in this figure we, uh, the first order street and the second order streets and uh, as i as i said earlier the city was divided into a nine uh, sectors uh, nine square concept but the city was divided into nine sectors and these nine sectors represented a certain caste system or a certain caste so now from india we move on to the roman empire because we are going based on chronology based on the time period on which the human settlements evolved so we are going as uh, its evolution over a period of time so from india now we move on to rome and to this roman empire uh, which as i said earlier uh, its ex uh, its time period or the, uh, was from 27 to 476 bc now you can see here in this um, uh, drawing uh, the location of the roman empire and the Roman Empire was completely encircled by the Mediterranean Sea and um, it was a large area as you can see how many square kilometer it is given here and uh, the socioeconomic characteristics was that it is basically an agrarian it was an agrarian economy slaves were used for the purpose of labor then there were extensive trade as I mentioned earlier in the uh, Gupta period that there was the trade was there with Rome so here extensive trade routes were there uh, through land as well as sea they had the very uh, opportunity of a strategic location so sea was there so they, there was extensive trade routes there was barter system as well as use of coins for trading then the society com was comprised of patricians aristocratic families then artisans peasants and as you can see here the figure one uh, is about the what is the uh, uh, inscriptions in the at the theater large buildings then there was this Colosseum figure two is the Colosseum which was also um, monumental in size in proportion so 
it reflected the characteristics of this empire, the, monument, the monumental nature. Then um, as we can see in the, the characteristics of settlements and the planning of settlements, we find that there was a reflected influence of Greeks, that is a strong Hellenistic ca character. City, uh, the, uh, there was a wall, there was a city wall which was used for defense and area outside the wall were used for farming and agriculture. Uh, the settlements, there was grid pattern, of street layout was grid pattern of street layout and then the city was de organized into neighborhoods and um, climate conscious materials were used uh, for houses, building houses. Police and firefighting services were prominent and the main components of the city were temples, forums, then fountains, amphitheaters. So these were um, prominent structures, monumental structures uh, in the city. The transport, uh, basically if we try to see the transport, the characteristics of, um, pertaining to transport, we find that the roads facilitated military policing, communications and trade. The roads were resistant to floods or any other hazards. Then there was intra-city travel by foot, uh, then uh, intercity by waterways. Then uh, when we come, when we discuss the art skills and technology, try to know about the art skills and technology, we find that there was public or official art as you, as you could have seen in the first drawing num figure one which was talked of, inscriptions were there. So there was um, sculpture, there was monuments, victory columns, triumphal arches, uh, then iconography on coins. So it talked about, you know, it was an expression rather an expression of imperial ideology. So this and that, as I said, Roman civilization left its mark on monumental, uh, on a monumental scale. Then um, as the governance, if we want to know what is the governance like, there was, there was um, the emperor, then there was the um, aristocrats, then there was, so you can see that three bodies of government were there, it was mixed mixed um, monarchy. So it was, there was a senate, there were the consuls, there was assemblies. So and uh, as you can see in the figure, there's this Colosseum, the picture of Colosseum is there. Then there was this theater, picture of the theater, the figure of the theater. Now we come to one of the uh, important settlements, urban settlements in this point, in this um, empire. Uh, that is uh, Timgad city. Now Timgad city, uh, you can see the location, this drawing shows the location of Timgad and uh, the plan of Timgad in the figures and uh, the um, triumphal arch which I was referring to, that uh, triumphal arches and monumental scales of uh, you know different um, buildings were there. So you can see this drawing which is of a triumphal arch and uh, the community, there was a social hierarchy and as you can see in for the city the governance was a mixed monarchy that is there was an emperor, there was an aristocracy, there was democracy, so it was a mix of all. And then uh, we come down to or we next we come to the, the characteristics of the settlement. We uh, try to understand the characteristics of the settlement of Timgad. Now the Timgad has a chessboard grid pattern, so as I said that Roman civilization, the towns was at a grid pattern. So similarly for Timgad it was a, it was a uh, chessboard plan, it was a rigid chessboard plan with varying house sizes and it was de designed as a residential colony for Parthian veterans of the Roman army who were granted lands in return of service uh, for their years of service. There were 11 parallel cross streets, then there was this forum, market, temple and they were artificially raised above the general street level. Uh, and uh, the city um, quickly outgrew and spilled beyond that grids and started growing in an organic fashion as you can see in this drawing. So after the Roman Empire going forward on the timeline we find that uh, medieval Europe, many things were happening in the medieval Europe and uh, which was a time span of 
to 15th century AC. Now, as you can see in the drawing, what is the, this uh, medieval Europe? What, what do we mean by this medieval Europe and the extent of this medieval Europe? It was the period between the decline of the Roman Empire just after the, and the rise of the Italian Renaissance or the revival which we would be discussing later. So this term which we call as the dark age. So this span of time between the decline and between the arrival or the revival or the Renaissance coming, this was this dark age and uh, literally no great construction or development was there at this point of time uh, or at this era or at this uh, period and the Western Roman Empire and Europe was in decline and then uh, there was this um, uh, there was a shift of capital from Rome to Byzantium that is which is also known as Constantinople and uh, the, so Byzantium empire um, came and there was this rise of feudalism. Then we have the rise of the Islamic empire in Persia which eventually took over Eastern Europe, North Africa and parts of Spain. Now the socioeconomic, what, what was the socioeconomic characteristics of this period? We find that there was insecurity leading to increased importance of religion. Then there, was, uh, there were these um, commercial areas where, which were established near the gates to prevent outsiders getting inside. Economy was principally based on agriculture but land was owned by a few landlords. There were need for self-sufficiency which, which led to diversification in economy. Then traders and craftsmen formed unions to safeguard their interests and the Eastern Roman Empire and other uh, countries were divided into smaller units. There was protection and defense was of paramount importance. There was, the, as I said earlier, there was development of feudalism. There were king, nobles, knights, peasants. And uh, when we look at the art skills and technology, we find that Sculpture was there, uh, illuminated manuscripts were there, stained glass, metal work, mosaics, all of which were at a high survival rate than the other uh, media that is uh, fresco wall paintings, then work on um, precious metals or textiles including tapestry. There was decorative arts such as metal work, ivory carving, enamel and embroidery using precious metals. All these were more valued than paintings or monumental sculpture. So this was a transition stage and this in this stage the major settlements which was as you can see figure 1 was Carcassonne and the figure 2 was Nordlingen. So these were the two settlements, major settlements of this period of this period. Now when we try to understand the settlements, how were, what was the characteristics of the settlements of this period? Uh, we find that the, there were city states which developed with an average population of 4,000 to 12,000. Then there were walled and fortified towns located on irregular terrains for protective measures. Then there was irregular pattern um, in planning which was devised to confuse enemies. Then roads re generally radiated from the church plaza and market plaza to gates with secondary lateral roadways connecting them. There was open spaces, streets, plazas which developed as an integrated part of site. The market square was the common, most common or most prevalent meeting space. Religious leadership occupied the, uh, when, we look, when we try to look at the location or the locational attributes of, of various uses, we find that the religious leaders uh, occupied the highest point of the, in the city. Then the city council which was symbolic of the people uh, were in the center of the town and then the nobles and the rich merchants lived near the entrance gates of the wall city and the craftsmen and peasants in the rest of the city. There were closely packed buildings and lack of open spaces resulted in intolerable congestion, lack of hygiene, hygiene and uh, prevalence of pests. The Medieval Europe was also categorized as you can see in these figures, in these pictures uh, by cathedral, by church, by monastery, cloister. So, it developed out of 
as you can see the cathedral church cloister monastery the bishop's seat which is the principal link between roman and medieval cities that would attract that attracted the christian settlers and it st started usually at the entrances of the precinct then it fanned out along roadways in a radio concentric pattern there were fortresses it was uh, that is royal castles palaces princely courts a radio concentric growth pattern centered on the castle as a nucleus uh, or castles as nuclei then in the early medieval period castle was a symbol of dominance and an object in the landscape and in the later medieval period it became a part of the town uh, filled with merchants tradesmen craftsmen uh, it got integrated into the urban landscape though it was still dominant but it got integrated previously in the earlier period it stood out as a as a separate entity now the historic towns if we see the historic um, towns the old roman towns resurrected through the growth of its remaining inhabitants and immigrants then when the decline of the roman empire the historic core which was high density housing areas and historic core that was another nuclei now this was followed by the palatinate or the falls now the palatinate or the falls is was ruled by a court palatine that is a nobleman who was granted jurisdiction over his territory and this attracted many merchants artists artisans and servants there was relative freedom and fewer tiers of authority then uh, the next nuclei was the nucleus was the marketplace the marketplace was at the intersection of a trade route uh, that is a business centers and um, uh, there was this growth these were the growth points from where the settlements developed and then there were these independent uh, settlements which had special rights and privileges to market and law courts uh, so this was the Uh, nuclear on which the uh, settlements of this period developed so now we discuss carcasso as you can see in the drawing the carcasso the location of carcasso map of carcasso how it was planned and uh, so when we come to the settlement characteristics of carcasso we find that it was um, date, it dated back um, dated back as early as 3500 bc but the but it became in medieval control in in this period of time and it had a population of about 4000 there was a castle with a defense wall and a moat as you as you can see in the drawing then there was uh, this roman heritage their ideas of law organization and administration of cities city life and this municipal organization all were preserved or there was an uh, the drawing the map also shows that it was organic layout of the town with the church of saint nazar at the end there were market places near the town gates there was this distinct social class of royalty priests and peasants then the, as i said earlier as i was dis discussed earlier there was a mixed monarchy uh, in uh, in terms of governance that is there was this emperor there was this uh, 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 aristocracy uh, uh, and democracy also now um, the next uh, example of settlement of this period is nordlingen was uh, so nordlingen uh, as you can see from the drawing its location you can see and in the world map and uh, the map of nordlingen also is here you can see that there is a radial pattern of irregular roadways because the town was organic the layout was organic then the uh, church plaza was the focal point of the town or the nucleus and then the there was this free town under the roman empire it played an important role nordlingen played an important role in trade and uh, this um, there was a wall around this town surrounded by a moat again the community the, there was this distinct social classes and the governance was uh, as i had mentioned it's uh, similar to what uh, was there for carcasso or for any other settlement of this point of time now the medieval europe or the this end of uh, middle age uh, 
was characterized by the holy wars or the crusades uh, for or the fight for Jerusalem and then there was this um, black death that is a plague the bubonic plague and the pneumonic plague which entered Europe uh, along the eastern trade routes between 1347 and 1350 and it eliminated uh, a large proportion or large part of Europe in terms of the large number of people uh, died and uh, the feudal system became obsolete and uh, then there was this war started uh, between England and France uh, and uh, as you can see this uh, in this drawing which shows the various um, time periods what is so dear students uh, with this we end this part or this module or this part of the timeline which started from Gupta Empire went took you through in, in, in Australia India took you through Rome we discussed we went to Rome Roman Empire from there and then we went to the medieval period and we discussed medieval period the how the settlements evolved what were the characteristics so we learned today about uh, about a part of the timeline of the evolution or the history of settlements. Thank you.